Have you ever wanted something so badly that you became incredibly focused on it, convinced if that one thing just went your way that all your problems would be solved? Well, if so, you're not alone. For in the reading I'm about to share today from the book of 1 Samuel, we hear the story of a woman who is in exactly that same headspace. The young woman, Hannah, was one of two women married to a man by the name of Elkanah. His other wife was a woman named Peninnah. And they lived in a time when a woman's value was largely defined by her ability to have kids, especially male children. Now, Penina was blessed in that regard, for she had many sons and daughters. But Hannah, not so much. In fact, she hadn't had a single child. And as those days turned into weeks, weeks into months and months into years, Hannah had had it. So she did something that seemed so appropriate for this time of year, this pledge season. She made a vow to the Lord. And she said that if God would just give her what she wanted, a son, that she would pledge not just 10% of that son's life, but 100% of it to the service of God. So what happened? Did God do God's part? Did Hannah do hers? Well, listen carefully as I share this week's passage, and then let's come back together and unpack that story. For I believe that very story can offer us powerful lessons about both receiving and giving that can guide our lives today. First Samuel chapter 1, verses 4 through 20, as read from the Common English Bible. Whenever he sacrificed, Elkanah would give parts of the sacrifice to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. But he would give only one part of it to Hannah, though he loved her because the Lord had kept her from conceiving. And because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving, her rival would make fun of her mercilessly just to bother her. So that is what took place year after year. Whenever Hannah went to the Lord's house, Penina would make fun of her, and then she would cry and wouldn't eat anything. Hannah, why are you crying, her husband Elkanah said to her. Why won't you eat? Why are you so sad? Aren't I worth more to you than ten sons? One time after eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah got up and presented herself before the Lord. Now, Eli, the priest, was sitting in a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. Hannah was very upset and couldn't stop crying as she prayed to the Lord. And then Hannah made this promise. Lord of heavenly forces, just look at your servant's pain and remember me. Don't forget your servant. Give her a boy. Then I will give him to the Lord for his entire life. No razor will ever touch his head. As she kept praying before the Lord, Eli watched her mouth. Now, Hannah was praying in her heart. Her lips were moving, but her, her voice was silent. So Eli thought she was drunk. How long will you act like a drunk? Sober up, Eli told Hannah. No, sir, Hannah replied. I'm just a very sad woman. I haven't had any wine or beer, but have been pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think your servant is some good-for-nothing woman. This whole time I have been praying out of my great worry and trouble. Eli responded, then go in peace, and may the God of Israel give you whatever you've asked from him. Please think well of me, your servant, Hannah said. And then the woman went on her way ate some food, and wasn't sad any longer. They got up early the next morning and worshiped the Lord, and then they went back home to Ramah. Elkanah had sex with his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, 
which means I ask the Lord for him. And thus ends the sacred reading. So this week's reading tells us that God had done God's part, that he blessed Hannah with a son. And subsequent chapters of 1 Samuel tell us that Hannah did her part as well. For the son that she bore, Samuel, was very soon given to God in service. So what does that story tell us then about what it means to receive and then to give? Well, there are at least two lessons that I believe can be drawn from Hannah's story. We begin with lesson one. It is okay for us to ask for what we need. Now, some might hear the story of Hannah and make a value judgment about her request to be given a son. After all, verse 8 told us clearly that she had a husband who loved her and wasn't bothered by her inability to provide him with a son. It would have been so easy for those around Hannah, including God, to say, Hannah, buck up. You have a good spouse and a fine home, so just be content with what you have. But God didn't do that. God felt and honored Hannah's pain and received that request without judgment. For God understood the significance of that request for Hannah. That's lesson one. Let's move on to lesson two. The requests that are granted are often extended for greater purposes than we can ever dream of. Now, Hannah's initial request was probably driven by two primary motives. Number one, she was sick and tired of Penina making fun of her. And number two, she wanted to feel as if she were truly a valued and contributing part of the household, which meant having a son. That seemed to be pretty much it as far as Hannah was concerned. But God took those self-focused motives and used them to accomplish things that were far, far greater than Hannah imagined. For the son that Hannah had, Samuel, went on to become one of the most important figures in the history of Israel. That boy, Samuel, became the prophet who helped steer the nation away from a system based on judges to a new way of being built around a king. And if that accomplishment alone wasn't enough, Samuel then went on to be the one who helped Israel pivot away from its first failed king, Saul, to its second king, King David, one who would go on to become, by tradition, Israel's greatest king ever. So when I put those two lessons from the passage together, it raises a powerful question for me. Who knows where the world would have been if Hannah had not had the courage to ask for what she needed and then step back and allow God to do miraculous things through that gift? What would it look like if you and I were to take a similar approach to our lives today as well? Well, I got a powerful answer to the question last year, just about this time of year. Let me tell you about that experience. The months of November and December are <laughs> incredibly stressful time for us pastors, for we're dealing not just with the increased seasonal duties of, of church around Advent, but we also find ourselves, if we're not careful, living with fear and tension that arises as we first receive the financial pledges for the upcoming year and then start pulling together budgets. In the midst of all of those things, last year there arose two pretty strong factions within our community about how it is that we should move forward financially. One group said that the way to move forward was to take tried and true traditional approaches with things like our investments and pretty much do what we had always done. A second group came along who said that these unprecedented COVID times 
called for bold new steps, meaning that it was time to, to look into investing in places like emerging markets. Neither of the two groups seemed willing to budge much. And in the midst of that tension, I felt completely overwhelmed like Hannah, uncertain how we would ever move into the future together. But thankfully, I had the good sense to do what Hannah did, to fall on my knees and to ask for God's help. And it came through two completely unexpected sources. Let me say this of the first. The year 2020 was such an incredibly demanding year that I was unable to take all of my vacation. I had two weeks left unused. And I assumed at first that I would simply roll those two weeks forward into the next calendar year. But due to increasingly strict employment laws, I wasn't able to do that. The church had to cash out those two weeks that they owed me. So I received a totally unexpected end of the year bonus. And the second source. Well, I worked hard last fall to pull together a, a training which happened in January of 2021 on domestic violence. We received a grant that provided a completely unexpected financial incentive for the organizers. So suddenly, between those two resources and completely out of the blue, I had $2,500 coming to me, which I never expected. So what did I do? a variation of what Hannah did. I offered it all to God. And because of that, God took me to a place I never dreamed. For I stepped into the chasm that separated the competing factions I mentioned earlier, the, the traditionalists and the emerging markets people, and I made the groups an offer. I said that I would invest 100% of the money into cryptocurrency. I looked the traditionalists in the eye and promised that if I invested or lost even a dime of the money I invested, that I would cover those losses and still write a check for $2,500 so that they were happy. And then over the course of the next 90 days, I tracked the investment carefully. And in three months, I withdrew it after it had earned $1,700 meaning that the final check I wrote to the church was for 4,200. Now, you want to know the greatest thing about that experience? And no, it wasn't the earnings or the number of zeros in the check I wrote. Now, the greatest thing about that experience was that I learned that when you step into those places in life where the world would have you believe that there is no way of moving forward, and when you turn that space over to God, things begin to shift. People who had been divided previously begin to think a little more collaboratively. And suddenly a new way forward begins to show itself. Anna discovered that when the little that she had asked for, a son, went on to become a figure that held the nation of Israel together two times of crises. And I discovered that for myself when an unexpected windfall turned into an opportunity to bring together a divided people. So all of this brings me to ask you a question this pledge week. As we think about the future of this community and its ministry. What is God asking you to give? Now, the answer to the question might start from a place of self-interest, as it did for Hannah, who wanted the child, and myself, who wanted unity and calm. As you give, you might think to yourself, well, I want to give such and such an amount to support the youth programs for my children. Or, I want to give to support the music ministry of the community so I can share my musical gifts. Or you might even think, well, I want to give 
to the internet ministry of this church so that that ministry can be accessible wherever I am. Even if I'm hospitalized or in a care center for a period of time, or even if I have to move out of state. And all of those reasons for giving are okay. It's fine that they start from that place of personal need. And here's the good news of this day, that God won't leave it there. That God will take that gift you offer and magnify it in ways that none of us can even imagine this day. In ways that can bring nations or nations together or, or ways that can even help us heal the great divides. So whatever it is we give and from wherever that gift comes from, let us take calm knowing that God will use it to do miraculous things. And from that, may we draw encouragement this day and always. Amen.